We're here today with Professor Roland Perry, who's a well-known Australian author, and he's on to book number 32. Now, can you believe how many books this gentleman has written? His books range in all sorts of categories with, you know, Donald Bradman, uh, you cover cricket, you cover history, you do fiction, you do non-fiction. And we have this wonderful book that he's written, book number 32, about General Sir John Monash and General Sir Harry Chevelle. So Roland Perry, tell us all about this amazing book. It's about Australian history in the war but it also is an international, relatively known book in the sense that it touches on a lot of what happened internationally during the war. Yes, well, thank you very much for that. 1918 was the most, um, shall we say, Australia was front and centre on the world stage for the only time in our history since Federation, 1901, because we had two great armies on two fronts. We had the biggest single army corps, that's a functioning army that goes into battle, not an army. An army is four or five corps, they don't all fight at the same time. So you've got an army corps, 208,000 soldiers under Monash. To give you an idea how big that is, six times our current defence force. Think of that folks. Wow. 1918 we had an army six or even seven times bigger than what we have today in 2017-18. Harry Chevelle on the other front had the biggest single army of light horsemen, 34,000 men under his command, had the biggest impact. What I say in the book and prove is that they had the biggest impact on both fronts. That's the Australian generals and the armies under them. That's why I say it is the year of our biggest impact in history. So tell us a little about uh, General Sir John Monash. So he, I was reading in the beginning of the book, it tells me amongst many things, so he has a degree in engineering, a degree in law, and a degree in arts. Good memory, he He's has. actually a barrister as well. He's what's called a polymath in the current term. It's a silly word really, only used in the last decade, but it means someone who's brilliant at many things or knows many things and gets his teeth in. But just in the barristerial side of it, Court cases of 15 years, he did not lose one case. Well, he did technically, in which the magistrate was bribed by the opposition lawyers. Wow. So he won everything he put his face into in terms of law. He wasn't the best on his feet, but he was the best preparer. That's something a lot of barristers and mates of mine don't do today. Mm. Let's be honest, they don't do it. He got into the courtroom, he had everything on tap and dominated. He even beat his uh, favourite uh, lawyer of all time, Sir Isaacs Isaacs, the first Australian uh, Governor General, Australian Governor General, Australian born. He beat him in their only court case and he was Monash's hero. So wow. It's an amazing That's scene. amazing. He put up 120 bridges, so he was a building engineer. And he said when the war began, I go into putting a bridge up to stay up. When I go into war, I go in to win. Now, no other general in history had that, especially modern history, has that mentality because you don't know what's going to happen, especially in the Great War, you've got masses of men fighting against each other just gung-ho on the front. Mm. Monash had a different attitude. He was an engineer so he, and he created his own weaponry. So this is a guy that's got a giant intellect but his hands on with, with guns and things. This is very, very rare. We all know brilliant brains. Right. Don't even know how to work a, dosh, a dishwasher. But he also, or, or put on a cup of tea. Being, being the engineer and having the legal background as well, he was able, apparently there were, in that time, there were engineers who needed patents and he was able to help them with the patenting. Yes, he, he was terrific in support of his men. And one of the things you rightly say, which no one else did, he's a man at the top, a guy invents something, sort of a water diviner thing if you like where water was on the front he would patent that particular technique for the soldier he'd show him right. how to do it mm -hmm. that was how he got down and dirty in terms of that but the other amazing. things where he used his legal background were amazing at one point he was told to park his army southeast they just dominated completely on, on the western front and he went to his boss and said can we keep in touch with the enemy got it in writing keep in touch with the enemy and they uh, and that was agreed to and that what does that mean keep in right. touch that means go after him doesn't it yeah so all right so this is amazing stuff so tell us the army that Monash had control of 
versus the army that Chevelle had control of. Yes. What well, was it? We against each other, but no, in, no, in no, comparison, no. In comparison, mean, yes, I mean, yes. like the size yeah, of yeah. the army. Well, you had one on the Western Front which was using all the big technology. The new uh, Monash said in 1901 got laughed at. The next war will be flying machines. There'll be armoured vehicles, which will be called tanks. Oh. He said. Well, he said, and they thought. Mm -hmm, cool, cool. 14 years later, he was absolutely correct. The Germans put all their money on artillery, all their chips almost on artillery, but they also had tanks in development planes and, and the Brits were catching up all the time. So that's the front war. It's sort of like a mechanized war for the first time in history. Right. On the western, the eastern front, that's the Middle East, where Harry Chevelle was, it's horses dominant because mm -hmm. you can march seven or eight kilometers as soldiers wow. in the heat and most of them were Brits coming out of, you know, really cold climates like Birmingham or something and these poor kids were sent to march uh, at seven they could only go seven or eight some of them were delirious the horses went 80 kilometers in a day wow. and completely Amazing. dominated the battles mm. to put it in a nutshell on the eastern front it's much easier to explain three Turkish armies you've heard of Lawrence of Arabia yes he holds one army on a railway called the Hejaz railway holds the Turks there you know terrorize them hold them in their forts don't let them out of the forts there are two other armies that, in a nut nutshell, is the target for the Australians. They knocked off those two armies, Anzac, 75% Anzac was right. this, this desert mounted column, not British, Australian it's primarily. Amazing. They knock off two armies mm. and then sweep across and help Lawrence take the third army and then push the Turks out of the Middle East for the first time in 400 years. Absolutely. That's the Ottomans. That's the Ottoman Empire. Yes. Remember, the empire had been crushed and broken down in Europe. They were left with the Middle East and they were absolutely determined to fight to the last man if they could uh, to hold on to that part of their empire, the Middle East. But we finished them Amazing. after 400 years. And look, Arabs uh, in this country in Australia should understand that we liberated that area for them. We then got out. We didn't have any part in the carve up of the Middle East. We got out yes. back to Australia and New Zealand and that was it. So in a way, they should be beholden. What happened in the next hundred years? Not our fault. Although no. we're still there, remember, we're still That's fighting. That's right. Absolutely. So Roland, for anyone who wants to read this book, we are talking, it's full of total history. And the amazing thing is these men are still recognised today. And you are definitely making sure that Sir John Monash is definitely remarked and remembered for everything that he's achieved. Well, both of them and both fronts, because I wanted that history on the only clown that's bothered to do two massive histories <laughs> right. on those two fronts. I thought I would bring them together because they knew each other, they were fond of each other as characters and explained everything to each other. So one knew what one was doing on the other front. But unless someone does it who knows what they're talking about, other, mm. other than some ideological claptrap about what happened and foisting their values of a hundred years later onto the values of the time, which academics do ad nauseum these days, because right. they're too lazy to do the hard yards and find out what actually happened. Yep. I wanted a story about what actually happened as best I could in real time, what actually happened. Right. Is there any particular highlights that you want to tell them, or do people, I'm, I'm guessing people just really need to read this book. It's just amazing. I think it's the impact they had on the two fronts, the generals and the soldiers under them. It's been buried in history because who writes the history? The conqueror. Who was mm. the conqueror? The British, mm. right? Not the Anzacs. Yes. Uh, one thing, our, uh, as far as mine is concerned, the historian hated his guts, that C.E.W. Right. Bean. Mm. And it's only now that people are getting to understand the impact that Monash had. Harry has been buried forever. Yes. because he was on the Eastern Front and the propaganda has all been about Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia is total bollocks. I mean, if you, he'd had enormous impact. And right. I give him great credit in the book I wrote about Chevelle and, and, uh, and, and Lawrence. But in terms of the impact of winning that war in the Middle East, it was Harry Chevelle, the Anzac, that did it, knocked them out. So that will upset a lot of people because they're steeped in the propaganda, right. the false history, I call it, Whereas Lawrence had an impact, as I said, only one army was held by him mm -hmm. and then the Australians swept across. So that's that's the, the integrity of it. What I'm after is the integrity of it. Mm. So Roland, I know you've written about uh, Monash and Chevelle before, 
What inspired you or what made you want to put this book together as well? Well, it is a hundred years on since the events and I thought this was the perfect time to lay out the impact that these two great men and their armies had on the world stage. As I said earlier in the interview, the only year we've been dominant on the world front and it deserves credit. Not to glorify it, but let's acknowledge the achievement of these men and understand that that set the pattern of this country and its values for the next century. We're at the end of that now. God knows what follows, but in terms of the next hundred years from 1918, their victories, those men who sacrificed, those who came back, all set the pattern for what this country is today in the Valley. And we are a great democracy now. Despite all the problems, we are still a great democracy. And most importantly, being the actress that I am, we need this to be a movie. We do. It definitely needs to be well, a movie. Well, let, let's put it this way. We need a, a movie on Monash first. I okay. think that I think mm -hmm. that definitely Harry Chevelle deserves it because it's been swamped by Lawrence of Arabia, that magnificent, one of the great films of all time. Right. But let's think of, of Monash. Uh, he is the greatest Australian who ever lived, in my opinion. And, you know, my book sold about 100,000 copies, but 25 wow. million do not know who he is. Right. That's my, so we need to get the, the word out there. Well, it's a frustration we because he's such a great there. character. Mm. And I'll tell you the big hurdle we have. The mentality on World War I, the mentality on World War One is let's let's look at a current film called Wonder Woman. I had to see it because I have a six-year-old stepdaughter and we went to the movies to see it and with her 13-year-old brother and we they loved it. And I sat there dumbstruck rather than awestruck because in the end of the movie it's Wonder Woman who wins World War One, not John Monash, and he she fights a guy called uh, Ludendorff, who's the commander-in-chief of all German forces, right? They have one of those mighty fights where they're thrown around buildings and they jump in the air. And I'm watching this, I'm thinking, how long? This goes on for 15 minutes and Wonder Woman kills Eric, right? Eric Ludendorff, the commander of all German. And then I knew that this wasn't accurate, of course. <laughs> There's no buildings to jump around in there. But Eric died, Ludendorff died, in 1937, not 1918. So what I, the point I'm making there is the mentality of the scriptwriters, the ignorance about what actually happened. They think they're a hundred years on, no one will know what happened to the Germans in oh, World War I. I see. No, this is, you know, and it's, it's an insult to the German army, it's an insult to the memory of Ludendorff, after all he was the commander-in-chief, and it's an insult to the history of what actually happened. So we have to turn people's heads around and, and filmmakers to actually learn a bit of history. It's great history, it's right. fantastic history because it was you know, it was a, a war, it was brutal, but there were some fantastic narratives in it, and one of them is Monash. But hang on, Gal Gadot in Wonder Woman. Yes. She's good. <laughs> yeah, you see, this is we what I'm up against. This is what I'm up against. I love Wonder People's Woman. People's view of, <laughs> She's of, gorgeous. of view of the Great War <laughs> at the moment is Wonder Woman smashing this German, who, by the way, was. But a we very need to good, get the history right. We need to get it we absolutely right. But we need it. Right. Right. You've got to do it with a great narrative. You can't do it with something. You've got to beat Wonder Woman, which is hard, because <gasps> Monash is an attractive sort of guy in a butchy sort of commander way, but he ain't Wonder Woman. Right. You know, he's not got the curve. <laughs> Well, I want to be Wonder Woman in your movie. Well, we could make a mature one day Wonder Woman. And that'd be more realistic. Yeah. Can't have a I'm the real. I'm the real deal. But <laughs> we'll have a real fight on the battlefield, not just, um, you know, you throwing people around buildings and things, <laughs> all right? So, Professor Roland Perry. Yes. Doctor. The book has done exceptionally well already it's only just out and it's already in reprint yeah it's, it's hit the reprint button so that's a good sign for it and it'll be christmas it'll do well because it'll run through 2018 right. because it's about 2018 so right. i'm very pleased with that and it deserves it i mean those guys deserve it not me so much but those guys deserve it and you can find Fantastic. it in all good bookshops and don't forget if you're into the net you can get it that way as well uh, you know you can get it it's, a, it's an electronic book as well Thank you so much for your time. So everyone, you should get out and get this book. So it's by Roland Perry, Monash and Chevelle. How Australia's two greatest generals changed the course of world history. That's it. And it's about time the world found out about it. Very true. Thank you. Thank you. Good.